Senator from Virginia. Mr. President, first of all, I want to thank my friend, the Senator from Michigan, for her comments and uh, views on this nominee. I um, rise today to add my voice to those expressing concern about the nomination of Betsy DeVos to serve as U.S. Secretary of Education. The chorus of concern is not only comes from those colleagues who have already come to the floor last week or earlier today or throughout, I know, the evening and into tomorrow morning, but it also comes from literally tens of thousands of my constituents who have contacted me about Ms. DeVos. I've been flooded with phone calls, emails, and social media messages from Virginians all across the Commonwealth. In many ways, at numbers that I haven't seen since the debate about the ACA. These Virginians worry about Ms. DeVos's confirmation. They worry that it would, what it would mean for our, our children, our students, and for progress towards proving and providing every child with a quality public ed education, regardless of their zip code. Like many of my colleagues, I bring to the debate some direct experience as both as a state or local elected official. I had the great honor of serving as governor of Virginia. I was responsible in that job for how we were preparing our students for success in college and the workforce. I took this responsibility very, very personally. As somebody who attended good public schools all their life, somebody who was lucky enough to be the first in my family to graduate from college, I realized that I wouldn't have been able to have been governor, or for that matter, obviously senator, without that foundation I received in my education. Those public schools, and I had the opportunity to go to public schools in three different states growing up. Uh, many of those public school teachers were the folks who framed my views about government, about our system, about how you actually get through in life. And I believe in many ways public schools and the whole notion of public education really forms the cornerstone of what is the social contract in America. That Getting that basic public education was a right of all individuals. And when I think back on everything that I was able to accomplish as Virginia's governor, the validation I valued the most that was when I left the governor's office in 2006, Virginia was consist consistently recognized by independent validators as the nation's best state for a lifetime of educational opportunity from pre-K to college and beyond. So as someone who is committed to reforming and looking at how we can make sure our public education can work for all, as someone who spent a career before in business and tried working in a philanthropic sense on how we could expand educational opportunities, I believe that I bring some experiences on this debate. And that's why, Mr. President, I stand here today unable to support the nomination of Betsy DeVos to serve as Secretary of Education. To put it simply, Ms. DeVos's single-minded focus on charter schools, and on vouchers, on converting federal education dollars into a different program is simply out of st step with the education climate in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now let me make clear, I have supported public charter schools. I believe they are a tool that ought to be in the toolkit. I've taken on those forces who stand for simply no reform in education. But I'm unconvinced that Ms. DeVos's complete setting of different priorities at the federal level is in the best interest of our students, our teachers, or our public schools. And that's exactly what I've been hearing from constituents all over the state. I'd like to very briefly share some of those concerns that I've heard. Laura, from my hometown of Alexandria, writes this, well, quote, while many of our president's cabinet picks worry me, none worry me more than Betsy DeVos for Secretary of Education. She says she comes from rural Appalachia, where she said she worked her way through public schools in one of the poorest counties in the country. But that didn't stop her from ending up here in Northern Virginia, working for the intelligence community. In areas like my hometown, where public schools are the only option, they become the lifeblood of the community. On limited resources, our high school had to get creative about how to provide for the students, 
often partnering with the local university. But shutting the school down in favor of charters or adding a for-profit alternative definitely wasn't an option in her low-income area. Another view, a school administrator from the Shenandoah Valley says this, quote, after her confirmation hearing, it was quite clear she had no knowledge of instruction, curriculum, federal programs, and most disturbing, had no understanding of the federal laws that are in place to protect children with disabilities. Quote, it is a serious business to educate children, and the consequences are huge if we do it wrong. Another comment, and again, these are just samples of thousands. Olivia, a teacher in Williamsburg, shared this, quote, I see so much potential in my students every day, and I feel very energetic as a young teacher about the opportunities that I know our public schools are providing already and are capable of providing in the future. She said she was concerned for her LGBT students, for low-income students, and for the future of myself and my colleagues as public school educators trying to do good for our students. Mr. President, I have received thousands of similar heartfelt messages from every corner of Virginia. Now, I welcome this level of public attention and citizen engagement. And sometimes, as the President's nominees have come forward, I voted for many of them, much to the consternation of some folks. But it is my job to weigh, regardless of that public opinion, weigh what I think is best for students in Virginia, for that matter, students across the country. With this outpouring from teachers, parents, students, administrators, civil rights groups, charter school proponents and opponents from both sides of the political aisle, I believe it does weigh. And that's what I've done, listen to my constituents. But more importantly, I've listened to Ms. DeVos's own words before the Senate Help Committee. And let me tell you, I still have a lot of unresolved questions after reviewing Ms. DeVos's testimony. For starters, Ms. DeVos did not demonstrate that she understood the Individuals with Disability Education Act idea. She didn't understand that it was actually a federal law passed by Congress and signed by President George H.W. Bush. Contrary to the impression that Ms. DeVos seemed to have at her confirmation hearing, saying that somehow complying with IDEA was simply a voluntary measure. That is not right. It's not the law. And boy, oh boy, did that frighten a whole lot of parents whose kids have special needs and without IDEA would not have those needs met. They're concerned that Ms. DeVos's seeming lack of familiarity with IDEA is indicative of how, if confirmed, her Department of Education would fail to protect the rights of these children and every ch child to a free and appropriate public education that allows even kids with special needs to flourish. Another area under the Department of Education's jurisdiction where I have concerns about Ms. DeVos's commitment and level of understanding is campus sexual assault compliance and enforcement. Since 2014, I've been proud to support bipartisan legislation led by my colleagues, Senator Gillibrand and Senator McCaskill, the Campus Accountability and Safety Act. At the end of last Congress, this legislation had the support of more than one-third of the United States Senate as well as a broad coalition of advocacy groups, law enforcement organizations, and many of our leading colleges and universities. The Department of Education's own Office of Civil Rights has also played a very important role in initiating and conducting Title IX investigations. So you can understand why many folks, including myself, were concerned when Ms. DeVos did not demonstrate any depth of knowledge about the difference of opinion surrounding particular policy issues related to campus sexual assault. Similarly, when asked a basic principle of education policy related to measuring students' achievement, Ms. DeVos was not able to articulate an understanding of the difference between growth and proficiency. In the same vein, and while this has become the subject of uh, late night comedy, I think it is a very serious matter, Ms. DeVos was not able to clearly express her understanding or her commitment to enforcing the Gun-Free School Zone Act, which, again, is federal leg legislation, also signed by President Bush, where compliance is not an option. These are federal fundamental tenets of federal education policy, not some obscure metrics, 
not small bills that languished in committee or small compromises. These are the principles and cornerstones of federal education civil rights policy. And they could not be more central to the Secretary of Education's core responsibilities of safeguarding students and civil rights. For all those reasons and others, I'm not able to support Ms. DeVos' nomination to be Secretary of Education. I know, Mr. President, you've had to hear a number of these comments. I hope that if she is not con confirmed, the President will send down an Education Secretary nominee that brings more mainstream views to this very important issue. Those of us, at least me, I'm all for education reform, but it's got to be led by someone who will always, always put the needs of our kids in making sure they all get a fair and appropriate education is guaranteed. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor.